I'm Craig McAtee, the Executive Director and CEO of the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers. Um, our four pillars are all about the future of work and uh, uh, smart automation manufacturing. Well, obviously, today's webinar is all about that, and you'll hear a lot from the experts we've, we've invited to uh, share with you. Our second pillar is all about work-based learning, apprenticeships, internships, entrepreneurship, coupled with our third pillar is competency-based education, industry-recognized credentials. And those of you that know us, the, the fourth pillar that wraps around those three for us is continuing to expand diversity, equity, inclusion, and belongingness of all of our underserved and underrepresented populations. We've got about 170 plus community colleges across the nation that are members, but even more importantly, we've got 45 corporate strategic partners that are making up, like I mentioned to Ray earlier, uh, we've got uh, a great group of robotics and um, you know CNC as well as uh, quality control um, uh, from Ray's company himself out on the West Coast. So we look forward to uh, having all of you chime in. But without further ado, I'm going to just give a quick introduction. We've got uh, Amanda Bergson uh, Shellcock, who's a senior fellow of uh, one of our longtime uh, strategic partners, the National Skills Coalition, where she leads uh, the organization's work on adult education and workforce um, uh, policies to expand opportunities for the U.S. born uh, and immigrant adults. She's got a great background and works uh, with a lot of policies, uh, uh, especially recently at the, even the White House. But some of her uh, media outlets include Time Magazine, Fortune, BBC, Higher Ed, uh, uh, Inside Higher Ed, Politico, and Business Insider, along with the Wall Street Journal. So she's got a lot of background and a lot of uh, uh, as I call it, street cred uh, for policies and workforce development. And I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to share in her uh, today's part two uh, of her uh, joining us this year in our webinar uh, series. Joining her is Anne Claire Anderson, who I've also worked with for a long time, off and on, uh, with one of our, our founding members, if you will, uh, the Center for Occupational Research and Development out of Texas. The, they're known as CORD. And uh, she has worked there since 1996 with a great experience in curriculum development, especially in the STEM project design and management, as well as professional development of facilitation. She's working on not one, but two very large grants from NSF. Uh, one's called Preparing to Technicians for the Future of Work. Uh, and she's also a co-PI on Building Pathways to Innovations uh, through Strategic Employer Engagement, which is a real big part of what we believe we need more employers engaged in education and training, or we're never going to get this done. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Claire to kick us off with her part of the presentation. And again, this is being recorded. Uh, we will share a little more about that at the end of the, the, the webinar. We will have time at the end for Q&A, but we also invite you to uh, put in, in uh, along the way questions that you might have for either Amanda or Ann Claire in the chat or raise your hand and open your mic if you're called on as you go forward. It's all yours, Anne Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation. Yes, I am the PI for Preparing Technicians for the Future of Work, and I'm going to lay out um, the project findings um, for you today with some emphasis on um, digital fluency, digital literacy, advanced digital literacy. Hesitate to call it future proofing, but isn't that really what we're all trying to do with our career and technical students, both at the high school level and at the community college level? So our project is a National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Program, the ATE program. Um, most of you are, are probably, probably familiar with um, that program's mission to, um, to help community colleges. Um, advanced um, various technological programs. Um, it is a, a cord led grant. We are a national nonprofit. Our work centers around connecting the classroom to the workplace, uh, seamless pathways from secondary to post secondary to careers, and developing training solutions that help America's workforce um, as we look to be globally competitive. Um, our mission is, for the project is to bring together 
um, within regions, colleges and employers to collaborate, to talk about um, what skills are needed, what's new on the horizon in terms of technology, and for us to um, develop ways and strategies to prepare US technicians, not for today, but for um, 12 months from now, 36 months from now, really trying to look forward. So um, it's, it's no surprise to you, uh, we're surrounded by technological advancements. And so our STEM technicians sit firmly in the middle of that. Uh, technology is advancing and that advancement is accelerating. Um, the growth is just incredible. And so what that means for technical programs is that our students, for them to thrive in this economy of change, we're going to have to think about what and how we teach in those programs. So the bottom line is the workplace is transforming and evolving. And that means that our students' career paths will also evolve. And you've seen that not just with um, students who are coming in from high school, but all of the students who are incumbent workers and come in and out for training. Um, this figure illustrates the industry 4.0 changes. And you know this, these are only some of them. But our job in thinking about this is to prepare students for success. So as the work, as the work is transformed around them, as smart machines, get smarter and facilities in which you work become more efficient, what does that mean for the roles that a technician plays? So one of our um, you know, good research practices is to um, do the environmental scan of literature. And there are many reports, many agencies, many think tanks and states and nonprofits that um, their research illustrates the need for our project. So for example, World uh, Economic Forum in um, their future of jobs uh, report that they do every couple of years, globally, here's the demand. These are really different from the jobs two years ago. So in the increasing demand category, take a look and think about categories that you see. So I'll, I'll skip to the answer, which is um, a lot more demand for data analysts and people who are fluent in data techniques. Also, um, a lot of digital jobs. You know, and you're seeing those jobs that are um, that can be automated, automated, but that doesn't mean the jobs are going away. The jobs are transforming. So there's still a demand for um, technically trained, skilled technical workers, um, but they may be playing a different role, and their role may be, and um, may be more advanced um, educationally than it would have been in the past. So what this means for technicians is that they may not be a, a graduate of a data analytics program, but they will have to interact with data analysts knowledgeably. They'll have to be able to draw conclusions from data correctly and then communicate interpretations of data visually and verbally. So um, the new foundational skills of the digital economy, which came out from Lightcast, which was formerly Burning Glass, uh, illuminates a trend which they call hybridization of skills. I love that term. It is um, taking skills from disparate domains and then putting all of those together on the workforce, but making the workforce stronger and the workers more valuable. Another way of looking at that, again, this is from Deloitte, is thinking of the new jobs in the new workplace as super jobs. We're not as siloed. We need a broader skill set. 
So what does this mean about what we teach and how we teach it? The project um, asks one of our, our big questions, um, what new knowledge and skills are needed? And are there any skill areas that all STEM technicians need? So to address what we teach, here are the skill areas um, that our project has identified. And these are the skill areas that will carry graduates into a secure working future. We call them the cross-disciplinary STEM core, and they consist of data knowledge and, and analysis, advanced digital literacy, and business knowledge and processes. Uh, for purposes of our, our project, we are defining cross-disciplinary skill as a skill needed in many technician occupations, so across the disciplines. And we have had to define that because they're, um, it's really easy to think inside the box and more difficult to cross over and collaborate. So here's an image calling to mind the uh, Department of Labor competency model pyramid. So here are the three skill areas across the bottom forming a foundation, but note that I am not saying that all of the competencies within each of the skill areas uh, of these foundational skill areas is required of every technician, but there are pieces of each that are useful in their roles. So why are they critical? Um, these three core knowledge and skill areas are essential because they transcend narrow job specialization. So companies can't survive with technicians who know how to work with only one or two devices. As markets shift and companies adopt new technologies, technicians need to be able to move laterally to other jobs, to learn new techniques, to work with new equipment, and technicians that possess the broader cross-disciplinary skills, you know, um, are more flexible in the type of work assignments they can take on, and therefore they're more valuable to their employers and better situated for um, continued employment, but also for promotion. So recognizing their value, uh, we have to ask, what's the way forward? What can we do? So our research on how future of work issues are affecting communities across the country, um, it included site visits, interviews, focus groups, work with subject matter experts, and four regional convenings of employers and educators. Um, those were hosted by Forsyth Tech in North Carolina, San Jacinto College um, in Coastal Texas, uh, the Maricopa Community College System, and then Gateway Technical College in Wisconsin. In response to that research, uh, the project released a framework for a cross-disciplinary STEM core. The framework re represents a paradigm shift for institutions and advocates educators being empowered to integrate multiple disciplines into existing programs, but also to develop new programs that support emerging disciplines and occupations. To provide some structure for thinking about this, the framework lays out some specific uh, recommendations for steps faculty and instructional leaders, employers, and even community college presidents can take toward supporting the introduction of new technician skills, uh, regardless of discipline or sector. The first of the three skill areas encompasses data knowledge and analysis skill sets, and these are needed across STEM technologies. Technicians need to be able to manipulate, interpret, compare, contrast, merge, and visualize data to resolve problems, to explain issues. They need to use Excel and other common software uh, packages proficiently. And it's really interesting to hear employers talk about um, what's missing, that they're not getting 
those pieces of skills that are kind of innate in today's workplace. Within advanced digital literacy, STEM technicians need to understand digital communications and networking, cloud interfaces, cybersecurity, machine learning, a lot of different skill sets and a higher than introductory level, but not an expert level. What we are advocating is equipping technicians with a broader skill set and knowledge that increases their opportunities. So I know that this is a particular interest to, to this group, the digital literacy and fluency skill sets. So you'll see they kind of run the gamut from um, you know, very complex to you know, some basic things that are taught um, in not just in high schools, but on down in middle school level, like basic programming and digital literacy and fluency. In business knowledge and processes, there are skill sets that involve understanding the enterprise, its value chain, its business practices. Um, and business knowledge includes a variety of work performance skills, but uh, understanding the ethics related to new technology adoption as well. Often employers say, well, where are your employability skills? First, I'll tell them that's a whole nother project. And if you're interested, it is the Necessary Skills uh, Now Network, which looks at um, employability skills within individual disciplines. There are a few that fall um, under our business knowledge and processes skill sets, such as um, you know, communication and ethics certainly fall into that category. But if you need more, there's another core to, um, NSF project called Necessary Skills Now. What does this look like within CTE courses? Uh, where do we find room for new skills? How can we collaborate across disciplines to meet the needs of employers uh, that they may not even know they need yet? So what we have done, what we are advocating is uh, the adoption and integration of skill sets within these skill areas. So here's an example, a manufacturing technician doing something with cobots requiring interaction with a human machine interface, and then performing some quick data analysis that he will need to communicate to the rest of his team. We've highlighted some skills that that manufacturing technician may need in this scenario. Those are certainly not the only ones, and those certainly don't apply every single day or to every manufacturing technician. Another example, this one, um, a woman in nanotech or biotech, she's in a clean room. Uh, she's a technician looking at maybe quality control and using data analytics skills and some digital literacy in that she needs to understand how the internet of things allows all the processes in her lab to communicate and collect and con convey information. Here's an example from um, Engineering technicians, looks like they are troubleshooting, uh, performing an overall equipment efficiency um, troubleshooting, needing an understanding of, well, basic programming, some AI, uh, the role machine learning plays in making sure that um, equipment is performing and functioning as it should. But we also get lots of, you know, we can give these examples, but it, it does feel like a lot. And so um, an instructor might ask, you know, how do I teach top, topics that aren't in my discipline? You're asking for cross-disciplinary connections to be made. So the framework white paper includes some recommendations. And one of those is to integrate relevant lessons into existing courses rather than attempting to add new courses. And Within, within those courses in which you're integrating them to use real world scenarios that you've developed with regional employers so that they have that immediate relevance. So real world 
workplace scenarios are essentially problems, stories, situations that take place in an authentic workplace context. Developing the scenarios is an important part of cross-disciplinary curriculum design. The real world scenarios, as I said, give students um, immediate relevance and connect skill sets they're learning to their possible workplace. To make introduction of these new knowledge and skills easier, uh, what the project has done um, is try to jumpstart uh, instructors' use and um, infusion of these cross-disciplinary skills into existing courses. And so we've created short, informative, introductory content for students and for faculty um, so that they can easily attain some introductory, you know, ground level foundational awareness and understanding, but nothing too broad. They need to be at least conversant on these topics. So there are no surprises when it comes to their workplace. And, they, and these cards are all um, scenario based. So let me show you a few of those. Under advanced digital literacy um, and the skill, skill set um, that is related to digital twins, there's um, an introduction, there's definition and basic vocabulary, and then there's a scenario. Um, in this case, it's a technician in the supply chain. So Ahmed is a supply chain technician for a large warehouse that fulfills orders for replacement computer components. His company re receives complaints, customers, parts weren't arriving on time or they got the incorrect parts. He needed to replace his entire in inventory management system with something that was more efficient and true and could identify potential problems. So he sought out and found a technology vendor that developed a digital twin that can provide an overview of the flow of parts through to his warehouse and also out of his warehouse and predict production and transportation bottlenecks that might interfere with delivery. So the virtual model is what is helping him do that. He's not having to create the digital twin. He's having to interact with the digital twin and the people who create the digital twin to make sure that um, the specs are met that he needs for the job. So the student content also contains um, forecast of where the field is going and skills they may need. And all of them provide uh, links to where they can find colleges that offer that program or related programs. The instructor also uh, gets two pages only, and that's important. Short was better in focus groups. They get the essential competencies. We also talk about the cross-disciplinary skills, and then they also have um, additional scenarios. The idea with having scenarios in different technical fields is so that someone who wants to integrate this activity into their course is not as um, timid about it when they can see it's applicable across a, a wide range of disciplines. It shows that it, it is applicable regardless of discipline. So um, it's important to note that the instructor doesn't have to be a content expert. You try to um, scaffold everything. So in this instructor's case, there's a manufacturing scenario, there's a renewable energy scenario. Um, on the wind farm, Daniel is a wind turbine technician in Nebraska, and he's part of a team that's responsible for maintenance and repair of several hundred wind turbines on his company's wind farm. The company began using digital twin technology last year to predict how turbines function under specific weather conditions, and also to feed into how soon they would need repair. Each wind turbine has multiple sensors which feed data into condition monitoring systems and then transmit real-time data to the digital twin, which Daniel can now um, access and look at. So here's an activity that goes with digital 
twins. Um, there's, there are instructions, there's a, a warm up activity, there are activity steps, there are tools available. Um, we try to link to all sorts of free tools. There are also, there's also background reading for the instructor so that they are comfortable um, in, in that knowledge enough to conduct a simple activity. So here are the ones, the cards that are available in advanced digital literacy. All of these are available. All of them are two page for the student, two pages for the instructor. And I'd, I'd like to emphasize that there are roles for everybody in adopting the cross-disciplinary STEM core. At the instructional level, that would be sharing the framework skill areas with your industry advisory committee and asking employers to prioritize out of those 45 skill sets, the ones that they need entry-level technicians to have. Um, using workplace scenarios to demonstrate relevance and application of those skill sets. Um, at the institutional level, uh, it would be providing faculty development and advocating for and supporting systemic change. And that's both in infrastructure, like new equipment, new technology, but also in structural changes that facilitate interdisciplinary communication and collaboration among faculty. On our website, we have tools for making this happen. So here is a list. There's the framework white paper. There are 14 instructional cards, seven of which are in um, digital literacy. There's a framework adoption toolkit, PD webinars. They're wonderful podcast. They are really, really great. And then there's a newsletter that we send out monthly that you can ask to be put on the mailing list. So your action items from preparing technicians for the future of work are to learn, adopt, expand, teach, and share the framework's cross-disciplinary STEM core. So under learn more about the framework, um, download it, read it. Uh, the white paper lays out the rationale and some recommendations for adopting the STEM core. Pictured on this slide is a glossary of, you know, that explains all of the terms within the core and they were developed with SMEs. So we didn't just pull them out of the air, but we, we worked with SMEs and then we had reviews by SMEs. To teach the STEM core, start with integrating uh, the activities and content from the cards I just showed you into other disciplines. So teaching, teaching robotics within advan an advanced manufacturing program is not really a hard sell. Teaching uh, autonomous practices within um, biotech might be a little more difficult. And that's where we wanna see the push. We want instructors and programs to stretch in order to meet the needs for a skilled technical workforce. So another verb on your action items is to adopt the STEM core. To do this, um, go to the website and check out our toolkit for action. It's short, it's straightforward, and it has detailed instructions and 15 links to tools that we've developed for working toward wider systemic adoption. To expand your knowledge about the STEM core, listen to the podcast. They feature interviews with industry and academic innovators. They're each no longer than 15 minutes and you can access them through the site or you can subscribe through iTunes or Google Podcasts. These are really, really well done. Kudos to Mike Lasecki, one of my co-PIs who um, did all the heavy lifts on that. And then share the STEM core. These 30, 30 minute webinars, um, they're made for professional development. You can download them from the website, watch them on YouTube. We have them in both, in both places. Um, the first two get into how we did how we know what we know and how to address these skills within scenario-based instruction. 
And then webinar three is our colleague Christine Christensen from Moraine Valley Community College talking about actually how they are integrating emerging technologies uh, to address the future of work within their region. And one of their strategies is that they actually have a, an IoT um, faculty technician who is there to guide them with any of their questions about um, Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, that's his field. He has an associate's degree and that big responsibility, um, and it's also going for his bachelor's, but I'm impressed that a college took, you know, took some initiative on that. So I'll save questions unless you have some in the chat. I appreciate your participating today and um, we can talk at the end of this so I can turn it over to Amanda. Here's where you can find me if you want to know more. Thanks so much, Anne Claire. That was just a wealth of such practical and detailed information. I know I'm gonna be sharing it with some of my own colleagues um, and I'm so appreciative that we're getting to kind of share the virtual stage together with each other. So I'm Amanda Berkson Shulcock. I am a senior fellow at National Skills Coalition, which is a nonprofit workforce and education policy advocacy organization. And my job today is to help you move from the kind of ground level or 10,000 foot level perspective that Anne Claire just gave you about the nitty gritty of how we can approach some of these topics to a kind of 30,000 foot level overview of some new federal funding that's coming down to your state whichever state you may be in, um, through the, the Federal Digital Equity Act. Um, so I'm just gonna make sure that the slides are full screen here so that folks can actually see them clearly without worrying about font size. So give me a second to do that. And then we're gonna take about, this will take about 10 or 12 minutes for me to walk through my section here. And then we'll open it up for questions either about Anne Claire's presentation or about mine. So you'll have ample time to ask any questions that you may have for either of us. So what I'm gonna do in the next 12 minutes or so is give you an overview of the Federal Digital Equity Act, give you a little background on how you can get engaged in state digital equity planning, and then give you a sneak peek of some really cool new research we have coming out that I think complements what Ann Claire has just been, been sharing with all of you. Um, excuse me, so hopefully that will be very affirming. So just a little bit about National Skills Coalition. As I said, we've been around 20 years. We're a big tent bipartisan coalition. You can see our mission and vision on the slide here. And as some of you saw in the first webinar in this series, you know, we have really um, documented through some of our research and our members over the past few years, that the pandemic really accelerated the adoption of digital skills. And it really illuminated for a lot of policymakers including those that are funding CTE programs and folks at, at higher education institutions who are overseeing CTE programs, that everyone needs digital skills, right? And I've put some examples on the slides here. You've got some wonderful examples from Anne Claire in her presentation, but I emphasize these because people often hear digital skills and they think either very elementary, so, oh, we're just talking about people being able to send an email, or they think very advanced and they think, oh, you're talking about cybersecurity or programming jobs. And yes, all of those are examples of digital skills, but there's a lot of other ways that technology skills show up in the workplace, including for entry level workers and frontline workers that we may not think of as needing digital skills. So I have examples here about construction workers and truck drivers and manufacturing workers and, and Claire mentioned cobots, right, collaborative robots. Uh, retail workers, warehouse workers. So really at every level of the workforce, we're seeing these increased demands for digital skills. But until very recently, the federal government was really lagging behind in terms of actually funding either career technical education programs, adult education programs, workforce development programs, to help people develop those skills, right? There was this assumption that people would just somehow magically get them by osmosis. And actually the data doesn't support that, right? Even the people that we talk about as say, oh, young people are digital natives. They all know uh, how to use digital skills. Well, they may or may not be comfortable with certain digital skills, right? 
even younger workers may be very comfortable using their phones to text a message or even make a TikTok video, that does not mean that they're comfortable using electronic health record software or using AutoCAD software or QuickBooks for accounting, right? Those are different digital skills and people need the opportunities to develop those. But, um, you know, for a lot of folks, um, that, that has been almost an afterthought. Um, and in, in policy. The infrastructure law that Congress passed last year really changed that. It made the first ever investment specifically in digital equity. And digital equity and digital inclusion, we think of as having kind of three legs of a stool. There's broadband access, digital devices, and digital skills. Can you get on the internet? Do you have a device that allows you to use the internet effectively? And do you have the skills to make full use of the internet access that you have? So this funding is new money. It is coming through the Commerce Department. So unlike money that typically comes through the Department of Labor or the Department of Education to get to community colleges or vocational training schools, this money is coming through Commerce. And they are used to funding economic development projects and business projects. They are not used to funding workforce development or adult education programs, right? So there's a learning curve for the feds in understanding our fields and the work that folks like you are doing on the ground. Um, and we can talk more about that in a minute. There's another piece of funding in the infrastructure bill. There's $42 billion for the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment or BEAD program. And I'm gonna talk briefly about that too. So what's the timeline? Right now, your state is or soon will be receiving its digital equity planning grant and its BEAD planning grant. And states have 12 months to develop a digital equity plan. And then the federal government will distribute formula funds to every state. And after the formula funds, there'll be a set of competitive grants that the feds put out that both states and other eligible entities can compete for. So I've put a, a rough timeline on the slide here. This is approximate. Um, it could slip a little depending, it already has slipped a little <laughs> uh, based on what the federal government um, you know, gets out the door. And I do wanna show you a resource with you that will allow you to touch base and check in on what's actually happening for your state, right? So last summer, your governor had to identify which state agency would be administering its bead planning and its digital equity planning. In most cases, those are the same office. They could be the state broadband office or another agency. In some cases, it's split, right? So some states are actually having their state library agency uh, oversee digital equity while the broadband office is doing the beam planning. Um, the federal government has a really handy map showing which states have gotten their digital equity planning grants. This map, which I pulled off the internet two days ago, is already out of date because as you saw in the chat message, our friends in Hawaii have already gotten their digital equity planning grant as well. So at least 10 states have already gotten their grant. If you wanna look up your state, I've put the link to this map in, on the slide here and you'll have access to these slides after today's presentation. Once you click on your state, you'll also get contact information, both for the state official that your governor named as the contact person, and for the federal agency staffer whose job it is to oversee the Digital Equity Act and BEAD funding that's coming to your state. So having that contact information could be really useful to you. So why does this planning period matter? Right? We all know plans, right? We know Perkins, Career and Technical Education Plans. We know WIOA, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act Plans. There's plans coming out our ears. The reason these plans matter is they will be the roadmap for how states are gonna spend this formula funding, right? And the bead plans will be setting the parameters for not just how do we lay fiber and get more broadband to people or to institutions, but where do we need to invest in broadband workforce development, right? Um, and in addition, according to the law, state digital equity plans have to show how they're going to close digital equity gaps for covered populations. And guess what? There's a lot of covered population overlap between the folks who are 
being envisioned by this law and the folks that CTE programs and workforce development programs are already serving, right? So veterans, rural residents, um, folks who are people of color, right? A lot of folks who might already be enrolled in CTE programs are gonna overlap with these digital equity covered populations. If you're already at the table on the, uh, with the planning grant with your state agency peers, that's fantastic. And we have a set of recommendations that I hope will be helpful to you. And I put them on the slide here that'll link to the publication. If you're not at the table, thinking through what kind of data or expertise or relationships you have um, that your state could benefit from might help you get a seat at the table. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. So what happens next year when your state is finished its digital equity planning? Then you'll get your formula funded. We don't know yet how your state is going to distribute that formula funding. Your state could have an open RFP where everybody gets to apply. Your state could have a narrower RFP that's only open to some types of organizations or institutions. Your state could even decide to push out some of this funding through existing um, uh, grantee pools or, or kind of um, uh, contract arrangements that they already have established with uh, higher education institutions, workforce training providers, or others. So that's another reason that it's really important to be at the table for the digital equity planning so that you can be in the room for these kinds of discussions. In addition to the formula money that your state will get and that your state will regrant down to the local level, you can also apply directly to the federal government for these discretionary competitive grants. So here's the list of organizations who are eligible to apply directly to the federal government for those grants. And as you can see, um, I'm gonna draw your attention to a couple of these in particular. So the first is, you know, if you're a local government agency or um, entity, clearly you fit in that first category, right? A political subdivisions agency or instrumentality of a state. If you are a nonprofit and you are not a K-12 school, you absolutely qualify. If you are a community college, you qualify under the community anchor institution um, definition that the feds are using. And if you carry out any kind of workforce development program, regardless of what kind of organization you are, you qualify. So this is a big expansive list. And my expectation is that everyone on the call today would fall into at least one of these categories. If you don't fall into one of these categories or you think you might not, feel free to contact me and we can chat offline. So what can this money pay for? It can pay for a lot of different things, but this gets back to some of what Anne Claire was sharing about the kinds of curricula and training that are really desirable for employers and workers right now. There's good overlap in terms of the Digital Equity Act funding basic advanced and applied digital skills and other workforce development programs, right? Um, and the Digital Equity Act does specifically define what it means by digital inclusion and digital literacy, which are both pretty expansive definitions. So I've just given you a bunch of information about federal legislation and um, funding streams and timelines. I want to bring it back to the people that you're serving in your classrooms and your programs, right? This is hopefully pretty common sense information. Um, and this is really just a sneak peek at some of our other research. I'm not going to belabor these points, but we know that people are most motivated to build skills when there's a clear connection to their goals. I want to get a job. I want to get a better job. I want to earn a credential. I want to be able to help my own kids with their homework, right? Whatever that is. And really helping people build digital skills in the context of real world activity is important. So everything that you're already doing on work-based learning and experiential learning and cross-disciplinary learning as Anne Claire was talking about, that is backed up and affirmed in terms of helping people build digital skills. And people do need opportunities to build both foundational and industry specific skills. So the last point I want to leave you with here is a quick peek at a really interesting study we have coming out in January. And we looked at 
43 million Help Wanted ads for the calendar year 2021. And of those Help Wanted ads, basic computer literacy was the 13th most requested skill by employers across 15,000 different types of skills that employers put in job ads. Even more importantly, almost half of all job postings require applicants to have a definitely digital skill and 91% require a digital or likely or potentially digital skill. What do I mean by likely or potentially digital? Something like making travel arrangements, right? Theoretically, you could pick up the phone and make a travel arrangement over the phone with a travel agent. But in reality, most of us use a computer or a phone at some point, a smartphone at some point in that uh, travel uh, arrangement process, right? This demand for digital skills is true even for job postings looking for entry level workers and even for job postings seeking workers with a high school diploma or an associate degree. And there's really stark differences in terms of the median hourly wages for jobs that require even one digital skill compared to no digital skills. It's a little over $17 an hour median hourly wages for non-digital jobs compared to a little over $21 an hour for jobs that require just one digital skill. So it's a 23% increase in wages to go from non-digital to digital. And that wage goes up on a kind of stair-step basis as jobs require three or five or seven different digital skills. So the more digital skills, the more money you're going to earn. So that's the end of my formal part of the presentation. I see that we have um, uh, a couple of things that uh, Craig has shared in the chat, and I see we also have a question from Ron, which I think is for Anne Claire. So I'm going to invite Anne Claire to answer that question, and I'm going to also invite folks um, to either drop your other questions into the chat, or if you want to come off mute and ask your question real voice, uh, you can do that at the end of, of Anne and Claire responding to Ron. So over to you, Anne and Claire. Yeah, I have to start off. And Ron's question is, how do we allay the fears that workers and employers may have regarding the replacement or elimination of their jobs? And also the fear of um, having to learn new skills in order to adapt to these new emerging jobs. And I think um, uh, Amanda's presentation um, talks about the money. And I think that's part of it is um, tying um, the new skills to increased opportunities for a better life. Uh, the other piece of the puzzle though, is that employers need to demonstrate the demand um, that it can't just be an institution's role um, to say, hey, we've got this great program, come take it. There have to be opportunities that are associated with it to allay those fears. In a best case scenario, there's work-based learning going on, there are internships, there are um, special workforce training pods that are maybe funded by um, the, the programs that Amanda just talked about. So there are a lot of, of different ways of going about that. There are paid apprenticeships. Uh, so it shouldn't fall all on the college or the student, but a partnership is definitely warranted to make that happen. Thanks for your question. Okay, open it up for other questions. Uh, hi, it's Ray Elledge with Veriserve. Can you hear me all right? Yes, indeed, Ray, go ahead. We are a for-profit organization that develops metrology software for inspection measurement, reverse engineering, digital twin, as you'd like to say. And I had a thought about putting together a, we do a lot of training already for customers in-house and on their, their sites, from SpaceX to Boeing and their entire supply chain. Could I develop a school, you know, sort of an accelerated program 
that this would help fund get started. If I understand your question correctly, you're asking whether the new federal funding that's coming could pay for the kind of training that you just described? Yes, in one instance. So the short answer is maybe. Um, and the longer answer is, to some degree, this is going to be a, a state by state process where state um, digital equity plans are kind of kind of set the parameter of what they are envisioning mm -hmm. as far as digital equity. The Digital Equity Act itself is only six or seven pages long. It's not a super long piece of legislation. It's contained within the huge infrastructure bill. Um, but if you click on the link in the slide that I gave that says legislative text um, and you hit the find button for Digital Equity Act, you can get to the, the short section within the larger bill. And the reason I point you to that is to say, the more clearly you can connect the dots between what your state is under the gun to accomplish for this federal funding and what you want to do, the easier it will be for your state to see, oh yeah, I see how this program could help us accomplish these goals that the federal government is requiring us to accomplish. So it will require a little shoe leather on your part. And you may take a look at the legislation and you may say, this is a little too much of a stretch. I'm not sure this will fit. Um, or you might have a, a conversation with your state and find out that this is something that your governor's office is really gung-ho about. But I think it'll require a little bit of shoe leather on your part to kind of connect those dots and draw the connections so that they can understand how investing in a program like the one you're suggesting would be relevant to the goals that they're trying to accomplish. Okay. With that being said, where in the world, in this state, do I go to get further definition on this? I mean, where's the contact? Who's the person? Okay, I'm going to pull my slides back up for a second, and then yes, I will share the slides. Um, uh, actually, let me see if I can just quickly share them in the um, in the chat first, and then I'll open them up on my screen. Give me one second. Um, I happen to be in California, so that's where headquarters is, and therefore, okay, California would be the governing state. Yeah, give me one second. Okay, so this is not letting me immediately add the um, slides in the chat here. Let me go ahead and go back to sharing my screen. Give me one sec. Okay. So let's go back to that early slide. Has the map. Okay. So the way you find the right contact person in your state is to go to this federal government website, which as you can see in the lower left-hand corner is called internetforall.gov. Um, and if you do slash interactive hyphen map, so internetforall.gov slash interactive hyphen map, you'll get to this page. And if you click on your state, you'll get a bunch of detailed information which includes um, the name of your state broadband contact person. So that's where I would start. I would start by reaching out to that person in your state and saying, hey, I'm really excited about this new Digital Equity Act funding. Who can I talk to that's working on the state digital equity plan? And keep in mind, they've got 12 months to develop this plan. So some states are already hitting the ground running, you know, um, putting together public engagement sessions and listening sessions to gather input from the public and figuring out who's going to staff the plan, et cetera. And other states are just like, we haven't even gotten our planning grant money from the federal government yet, and we don't even know who's going to write the plan. <laughs> um, so they're kind of all over the map um, in terms of state capacity around this. Um, uh, I, since I'm not able to upload the slides directly to the chat, I'm wondering, Craig or Trey, if you might be able to. I had emailed the slides to you, so you should have a PDF version. Um, and if not, folks will get these slides um, in the, in the follow-up email that NCATC is going to send out to everyone. So you will get them regardless. Are um, you able to plug in that internet address on your screen? And well, that, I can, that I can certainly put in, yeah. Uh, help me find... 
you know, how, let's see. Okay, so there we go. There's the, the website for the map. Um, and I've just put that in there. Oh, and thanks, Craig, for putting the slides um, in, the, in the Zoom so that folks can access those. Um, any other questions that folks have, feel free to either unmute yourselves or just type into the chat. Amanda and Claire, I want to <clears throat> just uh, re also up with Ray. Um, we're working very closely with several really successful community colleges in his area in California, Riverside. Community College District is one we talked about briefly in September when we were together in our conference. And I would be glad to connect you with some people there, the chancellor on down to help coordinate these kind of fundings. And it's going to take an army, not just a single entity to make things like this happen, I think, uh, especially in California. So let me know, Ray, if you'd like to connect with that. And that goes with anybody on the screen. It's really great to partner, you know, collaborate with education, government and industry to coming together for these kind of big funding opportunities and training the future of work. So let me know. Uh, those are my thoughts. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, we're coming to the end of our time here. You have the contact information for Anne, Claire, and me, so you know how to find us. And I know Craig and Trey and the team will be sending out the recording from today along with the slides um, to everyone following uh, today's presentation. Thank you all for joining us. And please don't be shy about reaching out to me. I'm always happy to hear folks brag about really cool programs they're running or interesting ideas they're working on. It helps inform my work in terms of our national policy advocacy and our state policy work. So please don't be shy about reaching out to me if you're working on something related to, to digital skills um, and you'd like to share it, uh, whether it's up and running or whether it's still kind of in the idea phase. I want to echo that and to say that I look forward to reading the, the report that is coming out that you reference coming out January, 2023. I am sure I will be quoting from it. Wonderful. I'm so glad it's resonating. Thank you all so much. And thanks again, Craig and uh, the team for hosting us. Thank you, Anne, Claire, and Amanda for your extreme uh, expertise and passion for this area and all the things we're doing in the future work. Uh, we will have this posted on our website. I put that in the chat as well uh, by Monday next week and uh, the slides as well for sharing. Thank you for sharing those. But we want to thank you very much for your time and expertise today. And uh, looking forward to working with you in uh, the new year. Thanks so Take much. Take care, everyone. And thank you for being with us. Bye-bye. Happy holidays.